Amen. I don't have a handout tonight. I, I'm going to start, if the Lord will, then I'm going to start some uh, another series here real soon. And uh, it's going it's to really be good. And uh, I just can't tell you exactly what it's about yet. But uh, Numbers chapter 33. Uh, um, verse number 50. Numbers chapter 33, verse number 50, and verse number 51. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan. First thing I got to let you know is right here. Um. You might be a member of the Rotary Club, or you might be a member of the Kiwanis Club, or what's that club here in town, the Lions Club. You might be a part of the Booster Club, or you might be a part of some place where they have a keynote speaker, or, or where, they, uh, uh, where they might have somebody to give a real nice speech and all of that. But that ain't what's going on in the house of God. Uh, I mean, if that's what you're looking for, you know, something to make you feel good. And, and, and I hope we do that from time to time. You know, I hope we do that. But Brother David, when we bring the word of the Lord, that's what the Lord's saying to the church. And, uh, you know, Brother Rice, it's, it's, it's funny, Brother Billy, sometimes I, I've, got me, I've got me some good notes and stuff up here. And, and really crazy because I mean, we have a tendency sometimes, you know, Brother Chris, when, when things get a little bit busy and a little bit tight, you want to go back there couple years ago and pull out something old and you know what I'll read through those notes brother Billy and it was like I don't even know who preached that you know I mean I just ain't feeling it right then it's because brother Ray the, the anointing is there and the, when the anointing is on you and the word of the Lord delivers something to the man of God to say to you and that's who I am you say well no I'm ain't building myself up I tell you y'all y'all know more of my faults than a lot of folks do you know, y'all know more of my faults than a lot of pastors, uh, the churches know about their pastors. Part of it's because I grew up here, you know, and, uh, uh, and part of it is is because I am transparent. But I will tell you, when I get up here and I preach something, it's the word of the Lord. And you, we are to receive it as such. So it's not really good ideas and it's not really good suggestions, but it's some stuff you got to take and apply to your life. And if I read right, Brother Robbie, if we don't take the word and apply it to our life, when all hell comes loose against us, we're going to be swept away. We're not going to be able to stand. And we've got to make sure that what, you know, I was telling, I believe it was Sister Betty today, which this is, that's kind of a paradox, but I was telling Sister Betty today, and I'll say it plainly right here in church, I, I, I'm ready for, for some of our newer folks to start getting involved with things outside of church. You know, start coming around. You're part of the church. Okay? Can I get some amen? amen. You know, and, and I will tell you, there's incredible strength. Incredible strength from being together with God's people. You know? We're around enough of, of ungodliness and worldliness as it is, but when we get the opportunity to be amongst good godly folks doing godly things and, and having a good time, be a part of it. We want you to. Don't make, don't make me got to come point you out and ask you. Because I ain't scared. Now, I may not do it but once, you know, after you punch me in the nose or something. When I turn my back. No. The Lord spake unto Moses. The Lord leads us and the Lord directs us to say things that are for your benefit. The Lord ain't never going to say anything to hurt you. When he told the young, rich young ruler, he said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, there was a reason for that. Because the young, rich ruler said, what, what I got to do? And the Lord said, this is it. And then the rich young ruler, he, he, he said, okay, well, it's out there. Let me see if I want to do it or not. It's, it's pretty simple, isn't it? He, he, said, he found out what to do, Brother David. And then he's got the option to either do it or not do it. The Bible said he went away sorrowful. Because he wanted eternal life, but not more than he wanted his stuff. 
Everybody, oh, I'm going to feel the Holy Ghost up in here. Everybody under the sound of my voice right now has got potential to be a soul winner. Everybody's got a potential to be in ministry of some sort. Everybody. I've got a vision of a church that there's, that there's like 90% of the people got a position. And the only reason why there's 10% that don't, Brother David, is they don't want it. Everybody can be used of God. <coughs> Everybody has a place in the kingdom. But, and the things that come across this pulpit, and when you're in prayer, and when you're reading the bread, and when you're in your Sunday school class, and when you're getting a Bible study, those things are given to you for a reason, and that's to make you a better Christian, a better, a better student of the Word, a better follower of Jesus Christ, so you can do something for the kingdom. It, there is, we got to, and I preach this so much lately, but we got to get away from the mentality is just what do I have to do to be saved? That's cut and dry, Brother Rice. You can't dress it up, change it, it just is what it is, the plan of salvation. But we've got to get a group of people that have got in their mind, I'm saved. Now where am I going? See, well, I've been thinking about it. I've been wanting it. You just hold on to your horses. We're going places as a church. The Lord does things almost every service that blows my mind. And y'all know what kind of crazy vision I've got. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, this is what the Lord said to Moses. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan. Now let's get something clear. They done been here before. They've been here before and they failed. They went over there, Brother David, and they failed. But the Lord says, When you pass over Jordan into the land of Canaan. Not if, when. And the thing is, the truth of the matter is, there's only going to be one event that will supersede your when. The Lord will wait on you until the trumpet sounds. He is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. And I'm just going to tie a little thing in there. I know that's about salvation, but the Bible very clearly says, where there's no vision, the people perish. you got to get a vision for what God wants for you in your life and how it fits uh, in what this church is doing. The promises of God are sure. It wasn't if you go over into Canaan, but it's when you're going over Jordan to the promised land. Now, I preach this a lot. I preach about the promised land a lot. I love Numbers chapter number 13. When Caleb and Joshua come out of the promised land, I, I preach about that a lot. But I want to stress it to you again, and I want you to remember this. When you are reading in the Bible about going over into the promised land, that is not talking about going to heaven. Remember, the promised land had walled cities. It had giants. It had animosity. It had enemies. It had wars. There was fighting going to be taking place. Ain't none of that going on in heaven. Ain't nothing you're going to have to fight through once the trumpet sounds. You're there. You have arrived. So Canaan is the place of fulfillment. It's a type of our fulfillment. And it was there. It is in that place where their destiny would be fulfilled. And it is in that place where every one of your destinies is going to be fulfilled. Remember, I told you about my book that I read. And, and I've lost it or loaned it out or something. And that reminds me, if I've loaned you a book over the last 10 years or so, and, and please try to bring it back. i got a bunch of books missing. Can't find them. But this book, the first line in this book, Sister Leanne, I've committed it to memory. It says, for most who live, hell is never knowing who they are. And boy, that's a mouthful. 
we've got to live in a world full, man, full of people trying to round pegs fitting in square holes because you think that's what somebody wants or you think that's what's going to make you happy. There's a place of fulfillment that we have in Jesus Christ as individuals. It's a proverbial, and I know I'm all country and stuff, but it's, y'all understand this. There's a place in the Holy Ghost where you will be walking in high cotton. There is a place in the Holy Ghost where you're picking them up and putting them down. I'm not talking about on cruise control, laid back and resting. I'm talking about with all kinds of confidence and, and with your shoulders squared back. Not because of who you are, but because of who He is. And you know what He's got for you. I, I, I really don't know why, you know, I, I really don't know why that, 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 just for instance, I talked about some of our new people getting involved more. Man, we're fixing to start some new stuff in leadership class. It's one Sunday morning out of the month, and we do it from 8.30 until, supposed to be 9.15, but it's usually like 9.40, but I can't help that. They're, they're just, they, they just are such an attentive class that it causes me to go long. But, but I, I talked about some things in there, and, and I, I've got to bring them out here and share them with the people. You know, th this is not a church that needs to be rotating around the pastor. This is not a church that needs to be rotating around me. And I, that's why, Brother David, it thrills me to death so much when I'm not here and church just goes on like normal and the Holy Ghost moves like normal. And, and that excites me. It's because we have got to buy, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, we have got to buy into the purpose of the church. And it's not to make the pastor happy. It's to make the Lord happy. <laughs> You know, you see people, man, they play hooky from church and you run into them at the restaurant at the church and they start making excuses and stuff and saying, I, and tell their kids, I told you Brother GL was going to be mad at you. Man, you ain't living for me. I told our church, I told the, I, Sister Betty kind of got on to me, Carly don't like me to talk like this, but she ain't here. You know, the purpose has got to be, Brother David, if I fall dead tonight, that revival just keeps on moving. That's what I want. This bigger than me. That's why we got to have you. I've been thrilled to death, and I'm going to brag on her. She can't whoop me, but you know what? I ain't had to do one thing about, about taking no food. I didn't even know they was doing it. You know what, Sister Maria? That's cool as I'll get out. You can't whoop me. Don't be giving me that mean look. Don't say no. <laughs> Sister Marie took care of all that stuff and got people, you know, mama told me, you know I'm taking such and such and so and so. I said, no, not really. And my first reaction was, man, they don't even need me. It only lasted for about three seconds. And then it was like, all oh, right, that's what we want. And you know what happened? I get to go to the funeral home and they say, thank you for doing it. <laughs> Shazam! Yeah. That's where we want to go. Oh, well, how awesome is it going to be when somebody shows up and says, you know why I'm here? Brother Corey taught me a Bible study. And I didn't even know he was doing it. Come on now. That's where we're going. That's where we're heading. Is that we rotate around the purpose of the king of kings. Well, I know it makes a little bit of uncomfortable. I'm still the pastor. And I'm still going to tell you what the Lord says. But when I preach it to you, you receive it and then run with it. Right. Say, well, I ain't quite ready yet. You don't know what you're ready to do. There was, oh, come on now, I'm going to preach. I ain't in my notes, but I'm going to preach. You know what, Brother Rice? David was very clear with Saul when he tried to throw that armor on him. You know what he said? I ain't proved that. 
There's certain things you can't do. You can't pass it. Some of you can't get up there and play the piano, play the organ, play the drums, play the guitar. Some of you can't quote scripture back and forth. But you know what? You beat the devil a time or two. Come on now, stay with me. David said, I ain't proved that armor. I don't know nothing about that armor. But that bear came after my daddy's sheep. And I took care of him. I, can't, I don't look like a soldier. I can't walk like a soldier. I can't be dressed like a soldier. But you give me just a few minutes and I'm going to go take that giant down. Huh? That's what it was. He said, is there not a cause? That's all he needed, Brother David, to recognize there's a cause. And then he went out there and he blew Goliath's mind because he said, guess what? You come to me with a spear and a sword. And that's what they wanted me to come after you with. But I didn't know nothing about that. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. There's a passage of scripture, and don't misunderstand, we got to stay organized and we got to do things the right way. We ain't got to go all willy nilly and get all crazy. But there, the Bible said there's going to be a time when you just go stand up and open your mouth. And he said, I'll feel it. It'll happen to you. There'll be scriptures, you keep on reading the bread. You keep on reading the Bible every day. You keep on posting stuff. Three or four of you post Facebook verses every day. You just keep on doing it. And there's going to come a time when you're going to be put in a position and then the Holy Ghost is going to reach back there because every memory that you have ever made from the day you were born is still in your mind. And that's one of the benefits of the Holy Ghost is it can over the river and through the woods and pull out something that you read that you had no idea you even retained. And you will with a thought, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Boy, I'm having fun tonight. And I'm wool slap out. That's what the Holy Ghost does, Sister Eloise. I might pass out when I get done, but right now I'm feeling pretty good. And the Holy Ghost will lead you and meander through that stuff and pull that memory out, pull that verse out, and you will with all authority speak it. And it's truth. God's going to use you to do that. This little bit makes me uncomfortable. Because it's just different, but it's truth. It's truth. Think about it. I'm not sure all the new ounces, but you read in the Bible, Paul and Barnabas fell out. It's in there. Because Paul wanted John Mark to go with him, and they did, but then John Mark cut and left them and went home. Then Barnabas came back and said, hey, Paul, we're going to take John Mark with us. And Paul said, he ain't going with me. I done gave him a chance and he burned it. Is that in the book? Huh? So Barnabas said, well, I'll tell you what then. I'll take him. And that's when Paul and Silas got together. Read it. It's in the book. There's a whole lot of stuff in that Bible if we'll just start reading it. Them, them people were just people. That excites me, Brother David. They were just people. But you find on later on, Paul says specifically, hey, brother, you bring John Mark with you because he's profitable to us. Somebody needs to hear that right now. You say, well, I failed. I failed. So, so did John Mark. He let Paul down and he failed him. But guess what? There was a time of restoration. And in the book number two of the New Testament, you got any idea who might have wrote that? Numbers 33 and 52. And I thought I was going to get done quick tonight. See, it shows you what I know. I ain't even that smart. Then, when you cross over Jordan and you reach that place of fulfillment, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. And there's some preaching in here. I'm not going to get to it tonight, but there's some preaching in the Word. Don't turn me off. Don't fall asleep on me. And I want you, after you drive them out, I want you to destroy all their pictures and all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. Now, without studying, without studying and reading it out, you're not really sure what that means altogether. So the first thing he says is drive out the inhabitants of the land. Now, I gotta be, can I be honest with you? Brother Bobby, I've read that all my life. Brother Robbie, I, I just ain't never fully 
grasp a hold of it. I knew it. I was on the periphery of my mind. But I thought, man, the Lord went around driving people out so Israel could live there that them folks never even really did nothing wrong. That's it. But I'm finding out as I'm reading this passage here, it, sometimes stuff just starts making sense. I knew what the right thing was, but I didn't really know why. But now I'm reading the book, Brother David, and I'm finding out why. Boy, I can meddle a whole lot right now. But the Lord didn't want nobody around that was going to be a bad influence on His people. That's right. That's right. Drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you. Now you notice this, Brother Chris, the Bible does not say they're going to run out of the land before you. It says drive them out. Now we know that if, as long as they did the will of God, just because he said drive them out, they don't always leave the old typical, let's pull out a sword, get on a horse and fight them out. Sometimes it involved marching. Huh? What did the Lord say to his man? Tell the people, march around the wall one time on the first day, another time on the second day, another time. We're talking about driving them out. And then on the seventh day, you march around it seven times. Which you can study it out. They marched around 13 times. It ain't too bad a look to me. And on the seventh time around, on the seventh day, he said, blow the trumpet and shout, for the Lord has given you the city. You don't be fighting with, don't be fighting. I preach this Sunday night. Don't you be trying to fight these battles of the carnal way. Amen. Drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you. And when they're gone, destroy their pictures, their molten images, and pluck down their high places. Now all these three things, pictures, molten images, and high places, are symbols of idolatry. Idolatry comes from the Greek word, and even in the Old Testament, idolo. Latria, from idos, which means that which is seen, appearance, and latria, which means service and worship. So worship, boy, man. Worship that which you can see. Y'all hear me? Right off the top of your head, boom. One of these nights I'm going to come in here. I'm kind of doing it right now, Sister Leanne, because, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of time to study today. You ain't, you ain't never known. You, you know, the Bible said be instant in season and out of season. You know, I, I was in the tractor repair shop today studying my lesson, looking out the window trying to watch the firework people coming. Smelling hamburgers and grilled onions and stuff. I want you to think about this just for a minute. Idolatry. Come on, stay with me now. Stay with me. Is this boring, y'all? Come sit on the front row. You won't be bored long. Listen to me. Idolatry comes from two root words. One of them means that which is seen or to make appear. And the other one means to worship. So to worship that which you can see. What have we automatically eliminated in idolatry? Oh, come on. Come on. Come on now. Oh, thank a minute. Don't, don't talk too fast. Let's know. Let's think. We're preparing a sermon. And the word idolatry comes from two words. means make it to be seen and worship it. What did we just eliminate with idolatry? Faith. Because faith is what? Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. I'm going to make a preacher out of y'all yet. Okay? You see, when they would make idols, it was because they needed to see something. Why? Because they lost faith. Their faith had got weak. This first refers to worship of idols, though in a derived sense it can refer to blind or excessive devotion to something or someone. In biblical times, I'm using a Bible dictionary right now. Biblical times, idolatry included two forms of departure from the true religion. I really wasn't aware of this altogether, but now reading it, I understand. 
That's why y'all got to get you some dictionaries and you got to get you some books if you're going to study the Bible. If you're, any of you got these things, I got it full of books right now. Full of Bibles, full of study guides, full of dictionaries. And I got like maybe 50 bucks in the whole thing. You can do it. It's cool as all get out. I'll show you one of these days. And then everybody won't think I'm so smart anymore. It involved idolatry, and we, we often, if I ask you what did the children of Israel do when they begin to worship idols, we would most always say they would, they would go away from the true God and worship some other God. When in fact, idolatry was, was that, it was that, but it was also the worship of the true God by means of images. Meaning that they would make an image... That, and that's, remember, that's, that's kind of what they did with the brazen serpent. That's kind of what they did with the ephod that Gideon made. They gave the Lord the credit, but they worshipped the thing. Isn't it? He, Brother Robbie? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, they, they made an idol out of a thing. Because they put their faith in the thing instead of the Lord, right? Well, I'm, I could do, man, I could do some teaching. I almost didn't even teach this because I didn't have time to give it to. We only need something we can see when our faith has grown weak. Think about it just for a minute. When they, man, alive. Y'all just bear with me. If you got to go home, hit the road. Hit the road, but I, I'm just moving and grooving tonight. Think about it just a minute. Appreciate that, Brother Rice. Brother Rice is nearing 100 years old. If he can hang with me, all the rest of y'all can hang with me too. <laughs> now, he's not. He's just near it. That, that about, like, about like an eight-year-old saying, I'm almost a teenager. <laughs> yeah, I know you will be 89 here in a month. Think about it just a minute. Think about it. I don't want to lose my train of thought. But think about it just a minute. We're talking about when your faith gets weak. The four men that brought the one sick of the palsy. Somebody tell me what happened. I'll let y'all help me here. What happened in that story? Why did they have to climb on the roof? To the crowd. The house was full. So they went up on the roof and tore a hole in the roof and let him down where Jesus was. Now, Jesus said, when he saw their faith, listen, listen, remember what he said? Somebody tell me what Jesus said. Come on now, y'all better remember the story. What did Jesus say to him? Son? Nah, come on now. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Then they said, Thank you all, rascal. Then Jesus said, so that you know that I have power on earth to forgive sin, take up your bed and walk. So why, man, think about it. Why did they need to see something? Because their faith was weak. You think about, think about the paradox of that. They had crowded in to see the Lord so strong. To hear Him. That's what they were there for. Read it in your Bible. They crowded in there. And then He said, your sins are forgiven you. And they get upset. So that their faith would be built in something they could see. He said, take up your bed and walk. Same, same principle. If they, if they really cared about who Jesus was, Sister Rita, they would have believed He had power to forgive sins. But we got to have something we can see. We only need an image when our faith grows weak. Think about it. Think about this again. Centurion comes to Jesus. And what did he say? My servant lied at home sick of the palsy. And the Lord said... I'll come and heal him. The centurion said, I ain't worthy 
for you to come to my house. But if you just say the word, if you just say the word, my servant will.